Good evening and a very warm welcome to the second of our Teaching for Neurodiversity Train the Trainer webinars. These webinars are funded by the Department for Education as part of a dyslexia and SPLD support project. My name is Alison Keeley and I am a regional manager for Dyslexia Action. I cover London and the devolved regions which includes uh, Wales and Scotland. We hope that you've already accessed part one of the training either by attending last week's webinar or by listening to the recording. If you haven't already done so, remember that the recording is now available on the Dyslexia Action website, www.dyslexiaaction.org.uk, and there are our projects, or you can search for Train the Trainer. For everyone attending tonight's live event, you'll receive an email at the end of tonight's session giving a link to the recordings and all the relevant materials. Tonight's session is called Understanding Neurodiversity. As with part one, the materials you see in the webinar been developed by a consortium of leading charities, including the BDA, Dyslexia Action, Helen Arkell, Patos, and the Sisters Calculia Foundation, with additional input from Steve Chin, a leading expert in dyscalculia, Fintan O'Regan, who has advised us on ADHD, members from ICANN, which is to do with specific language impairment, and members of Ambitious About Autism. To get the most out of this session, you'll need to have the combined SPLD checklist the Neurodiverse SPLD checklist on hand. If you haven't already accessed this, please follow the link on the screen on this slide and it will take you to the page listing all the delegate resources where you can set, select a numbers Excel or paper-based version of the checklist to download and follow during the presentation. Just as during last week's session, we'll be taking questions at the end of the presentation. Remember, you can post a question at any time using the facility on your screen, and thank you to those people who have already been sending questions to us. We'll select the most representative questions to discuss at the end. And again, though we do have a large number of attendees tonight, so if we don't get around to answering your query during the sessions, we'll try to include it in the list of questions we post on the BDA and Partners websites after the event. Um, and we may also respond to questions as we go along in, um, in the webinar as well. So. Without further ado, I am delighted to be able to introduce Sarah Meredith from Dyslexia Action, who will be delivering tonight's webinar. So over to you, Sarah. Okay, thank you very much, Alison. Um, so in the last session, session one, we discussed seeing the whole picture, and that gave details about this project and the importance of your role in cascading this information to your, co to your colleagues in your own setting. Session one also introduced you to a hypothetical learner who was exhibiting challenges in the classroom. And this was to help you think about similar learners in your settings. In the post-16 le uh, level, we met Phoenix, and she was a young lady with quite a number of challenges. We will be visiting her again later. In this part of the training, we're going to discuss what we mean by neurodiversity and how it relates to specific learning difficulties or differences. I will refer to it as SPLD. And we're also going to look at how we can identify and pinpoint our learners' needs by using a combined SPLD checklist. So, what is neurodiversity? Now, at this point in your cascade training, you may want to ask your staff members to discuss this in pairs or small groups to see what they believe neurodiversity is, and, and then feedback their ideas. And this will help to focus their thoughts on the topic. Neurodiversity is a relatively new concept. It first appeared in print in 1998, and it's attributed to an Australian social scientist and her name is Judy Singer. She sees the concept of disability as rooted in a social model rather than just the individual. So it's rooted in society. Although the term neurodiversity is questioned by some, it can be seen as a much more positive term as opposed to such labels as minimal brain dysfunction or atypical brain development, which sound overtly medical and can have very negative connotations. So this slide gives a definition of neurodiversity. 
and this came from the Syracuse University Symposium on Neurodiversity. It shows that although neurodiversity movement grew out of the autism rights movement, the concept of neurodiversity has now expanded to include all neuro-minorities, including those with dyscalculia, dyslexia, ADHD, SLI, which is specific language impairment, autistic spectrum, developmental coordination disorder, and others. The neurodiversity movement recognizes that there is not just one right way to think and perceive the world. The movement works towards a world where people's brain differences are seen as valuable differences rather than something that needs to be fixed. Now, if you wanted to uh, do further reading on this particular concept, um, there is a website that you can visit, um, which is www.autismacceptancemonth.com. Now, um, that should also be in your pack, so if you do want to refer to that, please do. So, what we're trying to say is, is that neurodiversity movement celebrates and embraces all kinds of minds, and so it should. So, SPLD and neurodiversity. Now, tips for cascading here. Before going on to deliver your next part of the, the notes that you're using, it may be useful to ask your staff what they understand by the term SPLD. Um, it's a fairly uh, common word in, in common parlance, and so most people should have some sort of idea, and they may be able to give you such answers as SPLD can affect the way information is processed, um, their lifelong conditions can't be cured, they can appear across all ranges of ability with varying severity, they are often hidden sometimes by compensatory strategies, and I'm sure there will be others as well. A useful activity may be a matching exercise which requires your colleagues to match particular behaviours or traits to different SPLD. And you can get some great ideas of what to include um, from the combined SPLD checklist, which I will show you later. And also, looking at the Guide to SPLD, which is included in your training materials. This provides a useful guide on the different kinds of SPLD. I think you'll find that quite helpful. As the previous slide showed, the term neurodiversity encompasses all specific learning differences, many of which may co-occur and overlap, as this diagram will now show you. It's particularly important to notice that the various SPLD overlap, and this is because a student is likely to have one or more co-occurring difficulties. In 2001, Gilger and Kaplan wrote, in developmental disorders, comorbidity is the rule, not the exception. Now, comorbidity is, is rather a... a an unusual word to use as well, that a lot, not a lot of people like to use, so you could use the word co-occurrence. So what that means is that if each student has a mix of characteristics from different learning differences, we can't assume anything, either about their needs and abilities, or about the type of support and intervention that will work for them. A learner's difficulties do not fit into one neat package. We have to recognize the complexity of each individual profile and treat each student accordingly. So you may want to pose the question, well, is it useful to label a student as being dyslexic or dyspraxic or any of the other SPLDs? And the answer really depends on how you're going to use the information. If you're going to use it to increase your understanding of a student's learning needs and to help inform the provision that you put in place to support them, then yes, it is indeed very useful. But if it becomes a barrier to putting support in place, it most definitely is not. By using neurodiversity as an overarching term, 
we're encouraging you to look at learners in a more holistic way, focusing on what they can do well and what their individual needs are rather than just dwelling on what label you should use to categorize them. Moving from labeling to profiling helps to empower the, the lecturers and support tutors to understand that they can provide support within the classroom without relying on the services of an expert. Now, um, in your packs you will find suggestions for further reading about this as well, so please do take a look. Um, <clears throat> now, as it was also mentioned in session one, that this training is aimed at all staff to give a basic awareness. So, but I am assuming that most of the people listening tonight do have a certain level of uh, specialism. And so I'm not going to go through the different difficulties that you can see on the screen right now. Um, I'm assuming that you, you have an idea of, of most of those there. Um, if you don't, um, you can refer to the, the uh, guide to SPLT, which will provide you with that extra information. Or if you do have a particular burning question at the end about any of those, then please do ask. So, the combined SPLD checklist. Now, this is a checklist that we've developed, and it pulls together all of the behaviours and indicators associated with a range of SPLD. So that's going to include uh, dyslexia and DCD and ADHD, ASD. So all those difficulties, it's pulled together all the traits and characteristics that you might find. And the aim of this is to discourage educators from seeing students in terms of one particular SPLD. So for example, Joanne is dyslexic, and so she'll have difficulties with X, Y, and Z. It's not quite as simple as that, as I'm sure you already know. Instead, we want to encourage educators to be open-minded and to build a unique picture of students' needs in which a number of different SPLD may overlap. In other words, we want to see our students in terms of neurodiversity. And this has the potential to result in a much more tailored approach to meeting the students' needs. So when and why should you use a checklist? So if you're concerned that a student is not making the expected rate of progress, or is having difficulties with certain aspects of learning, a checklist is a quick, easy-to-use first step in a graduated response. That is, assess, plan, do, review. Now, what I'm going to do now is show you um, a checklist live in action so you can actually see um, how it works. So, I'm going to... This is the combined SPLD checklist for the post-16 level, and it's one I made earlier. You can see I've been um, making some, um, some input down the side with the orange and the red. And as you can see... They, each of the characteristics have been sort of lumped into the various SPLD. So down that left-hand side, you can see um, traits associated with dyslexia. Going down, we have dyspraxia, DCD. We have a impairment. And at the bottom here is a recommended actions box, which will be completed at the end. And that might be done by the, um, the team leader in your uh, support team or um, somebody with, with, with that specialism. But that would be completed based on the outcome of what you have here. So let me show you. So you would go into the, um, each trait, and um, if you feel that it is relevant, you have three options. Not at all, which you can leave blank. Sometimes, we shall click, and that comes out as the orange amber. Um, and then showing you another one with often, that comes out in red. And you would do this reading through all those different characteristics 
until um, you've exhausted the list. And so you can then filter using this button up here. So I'm going to just filter that out. And as you can see, it has just filtered out everything that is not relevant and has just left the relevant traits. And this then helps guide you as to what to do next. Um, so the, the red uh, col column will show you that's quite a big issue. We need to be looking into this, seeing what the challenges are and how we can help. And then the sometimes is the, well, you know, we, we need to be cautious of this and, and take it into account. So I hope that helps you see that that's working in action. Um, and you can have a play around with that. That is uh, in your pack. So you can have a play around with that at your leisure. So I'm now going to return to the page. And just to say that the benefits of using the checklist are that it's quick and easy to use, it doesn't require any specialist training, it provides a framework through which to observe the student learning behaviours and to help build your profile of the student needs. It helps to identify any areas in which the student requires additional support. And if the checklist indicates a range of difficulties commensurate with one or more particular SPLD, the next step would be to consult the SENCO or the, uh, the manager within your support team, who will then decide whether it's appropriate to carry out further assessments or to refer on for a full diagnostic assessment. One thing to bear in mind, though, this checklist is not a diagnostic tool. So please don't feel that it's um, going to give you the answers to everything. It is just a guide to help you. So what about Phoenix? Now, we, we met Phoenix in session one. Um, her lead tutor had noticed some areas of challenge in the classroom and felt it was important to investigate further. And just to remind you, Phoenix, she's 17 and she's just started a hairdressing course at her local FE college. Um, she's always been very keen on hairdressing and she has excellent practical skills, but she does get stressed with too many instructions. She sometimes appears to completely ignore instructions and she's always on the go. She actually plays football in, in the local ladies football club. In college, she is struggling to apply ratios when preparing dyes, which of course could potentially lead to some unexpected chemical reactions. Her tutor has noticed that she reverses numbers so that she sees 12 as 21 and things like that. And she freezes when any maths is required. She says that maths is a waste of time and nothing to do with hairdressing. And clearly that is not the case. Now, Phoenix is a hypothetical learner, and she may not fit in with your kind of learner in, in your setting, um, so you, you can adapt the hypothetical example to suit your own needs. Now, Phoenix Leads Tutor has uh, raised concerns with uh, the learning support team about her numeracy issues and her anxiety, and the combined SPLD checklist was used to see if it can help understand more about her needs. So that's what was done there. Um, and in a discussion with Phoenix and her lead tutor and a member of the learning support team uh, took place. And Phoenix's mother was also invited and she attended as well. And it really is best practice for these discussions with the students and a parent, if possible, to be face to face. Um, there is quite a skill to this, um, so it is something you might uh, need to look into in, in a bit more detail. Um, but anyway, in Phoenix's case, the support was put in place, and you will learn more about that, that in session three, along with lots of other ideas for resources and tools and strategies. Um, 
But in a nutshell, Phoenix, she, she now receives one-to-one -one support for her numeracy, um, and that will give her strategies to help herself when she is working independently. Um, she's being considered for exam access arrangements, and her anxiety around maths is beginning to decrease. She's been encouraged to use her smartphone, so to use it to take photographs of important information, and also using it to record um, any voice recordings using a, an app to record important information. And Phoenix tutors are now more aware of the challenges she faces with her learning and are encouraging her to record information visually when making notes. And they give instructions in smaller chunks. So um, she's also um, learned strategies, for example, things like a memory palace. Um, now, this is a very successful uh, strategy for people with, with poor memory when they're revising. And what you do with this is you imagine you're in a place that you know very well, and then you use items in that room and link them to items you want to remember. This is quite a successful strategy. So, um, like I said, conducting meetings with students and parents about their learning needs is quite a skill that you know that comes with practice uh, and experience. But there is also a link, um, which is in your information pack, which will also give you some useful tips and advice. So please do refer to that um, before uh, giving uh, having any of these discussions. So, what about your learner? Um, thinking about a student in your setting, you may want to suggest the following ideas when cascading the training. So, you could ask all teaching staff and support staff to trial the checklist for at least one student, um, and less competent members of staff may want to pair up and work together, and then build in feedback and discussion groups. Ensure that everyone understands the importance of completing the recommendations box, because that really will help guide going forward. This activity could be set as homework to be completed prior to the next training session. You know, I am aware that time can be an issue with staff and colleagues, um, but you know, this is something that's going to be of great use to them uh, going forward. And next steps, it's crucial for there to be a clear policy on the outcomes as a result of using the checklist. So what support's going to be implemented? Um, will there be any external agencies involved? Um, so you need to, to think about all these um, various um, outcomes as a result and, and build it into your clear policy. It's also important to bear in mind the following. Slow progress and low attainment do not necessarily mean that a student has SEM and should not automatically lead to a student being recorded as having SEM. There is a huge range of normal in learner development and we shouldn't be in a hurry to label young people. Not all challenges result from SPLD or neurodiversity. Slow progress may be the result of any number of factors, and you may want to discuss this with staff as well. Expected suggestions might be uh, poor attendance, lack of opportunity, illness, effects of medication. The person might, be, might have English as an additional language. Or they may be young in the year group, so there's all sorts of other factors that you do need to bear in mind. And this information should be gathered through interviews with the parent or carer and looking at student records. And remember, this information will also need to be recorded on a student profile. Um, also important to note that very sudden changes in behaviour may indicate a medical condition, so could be a red flag for referral there as well. It's also important to point out that we must not jump to conclusions based upon a supervisual observation of a student's performance. So if you think about that iceberg shown in the session one, you know, there's uh, um, a lot going on under the surface. So, so, it should 
should not be assumed that, that attainment in line with chronological age means that there is no learning difficulty or disability. Many students develop compensatory strategies which can mask their difficulties. A student who is performing at the average level may be capable of doing much better if given the support they need. Remember that learning difficulties occur across the range of cognitive abilities and if left unaddressed it may lead to frustration and this could manifest itself as disaffection or emotional and behavioural difficulties. All adults working with students need to notice, respond and adjust to students' needs to recognise their challenges at as early a stage as possible and to put in place provision to support. So, the next step. How are you going to go about cascading this information uh, included in this part of the training? What resources and activities are you going to use? And how will you use the tips for cascading included in the presenter notes? Do you foresee any difficulties? If so, what will you do to overcome them? I do suggest that you have a good look through all the materials and adapt and change them to suit your own settings. Um, you know, you, you all have different settings, different kinds of learners, so I do understand you may need to do some changes to the uh, resources and materials that you have. Um, now, whilst you may have many of your own ideas for cascading, Session 3 next week will uh, offer a range of strategies, tools and resources to help you in this process. So that is um, the basics of neurodiversity. Um, so if you have any questions, please go ahead and um, I will endeavour to answer them if I can. Hi Sarah, so it's Alison, I'm back with you again. I have um, sort of two or three questions here for you on a variety of different topics. So the first one we've got, which is from um, one of our attendees called Anne, she is asking, is it necessary to diagnose an SPLD before putting support in place for the learner? Well Anne, absolutely not. Um, if you can identify what their difficulties are, there, there is no need for them to have a diagnosis of anything unless it is particularly bad. If, if it's having a huge impact on their day-to-day -day, um, life in college um, or school or wherever they are, then of course it would be a good idea to have a diagnosis to see how to help them. But as far as, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis in school, in the school or college, um, as long as you are aware of what their needs are, um, you should be looking to make the classroom as inclusive as possible and be able to support them within the classroom environment. I hope that helps a little bit. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. So um, it appears we've got quite a few people from both FE and HE with us tonight on the webinar, which is great to see. And a lot of questions about how um, the and sort of DSA and things like that for students who are at the, the appropriate level for that kind of funding and support. So have you got anything to say about the differences in ways of supporting students between FE and HE institutions? Um, again, I, I believe, I mean, there isn't too much of a difference. I know universities, um, I think each university actually has their own um, set of rules and guidance that they adhere to. Um, I, I'm also aware that um, most universities also have a very good um, support structure um, set up within each of their um, departments. So um, I think um, generally, when it is um, at university level, they will have had an assessment in order to claim for the DSA and then they will um, have whatever recommendations put in place, which is excellent. Um, I know that uh, most FE colleges try their very best to give support um, as, as best they can and I know that um, 
having an FE background myself, um, time, resources, funding, etc., is always an issue. Um, but I'm also aware that many tutors in, in FE colleges are very keen to try to support the students they have in their classes and uh, you know, keen to learn as much as they can about how they can be inclusive in the classroom. Um, and I, I think that um, if, if they don't have a, you know, a clear idea, they are usually very keen to talk to uh, people from the support department. And of course, this cascading that you're going to be doing will be so helpful for them. Um, and uh, of course, exam concessions can be put in place for, um, for those in FE, um, and they will have to have the relevant assessments done in order to claim for those. Thank you, Sarah. That was absolutely lovely. So, um, we've got some other questions here as well, which are being added to by the second, which is fantastic to see everybody engaging in the webinar. Really pleased to see that. So, <coughs> there is one individual saying that in their FE institution, students can't get, this is from Katie, a lady called Katie, they can't get one-to-one -one support without an EHCP. So what is needed to access one-to-one -one help is, is even more than a diagnosis. So what would you advise in those cases where the potential for one-to-one -one support just isn't going to be able to be accessed? Gosh, yes. I mean, that, that really does show a sign of the times, doesn't it? Um, because, you know, it would be highly unlikely for somebody with, with dyslexia or um, dyspraxia to have an EHCP. Um, and, um, but, you know, although they, they have these these challenges um, you know they, they wouldn't the, the expectation really is is that these challenges can be supported within the classroom um, and I think again this is where this this cascade of training that you're going to be doing Katie is absolutely vital because you're going to be able to equip the tutors with um, the knowledge and give ideas of resources and tools and software that tutors can advise their uh, students in the classroom to be using. Um, and whilst one-to-one -one support really would be the ideal situation, I can appreciate that is not always going to happen in your setting. So it's so important that tutors can, you know, can come together with this and really uh, try to be so aware of these students with the difficulties they have and to help them as best they can. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. So we've got some more questions here as well. So that I also wanted to add something because there are lots of questions that are coming in with related to DSA and HE and things like that. So I just wanted to make something clear as well. So the funding that was provided for the Department of Education for this project was aimed to be for primary, secondary and further education. So although we are very, very happy to have people from higher education here with us and it's certainly we've even we've been doing the face-to-face -face uh, training as well, we've certainly met a lot of individuals from um, higher education institutions and we welcome your interest and your and your but we are aware that some of what we're saying won't be relevant for you. Um, it is something we are putting to the DfE if we get to um, take the project further. So the project will be finishing in March, but we would like to take the project further and the evidence, the, the interest that people are meeting. So for those of you who are coming from an HE background, just just so that you're aware that if you're feeling that maybe this was there are things here that don't quite um, fit with your settings, the, that that would be the reason for that. But we we are very happy to see you, and we do feel that a lot of the information that we are sharing in these webinars is um, important in any level of post-16 education. So I have some other um, questions for you here, Sarah. So um, at HE, students go through the specific process to access DSA for support, which is flagged up via initial screeners. They, she's saying they would be concerned if the lecturers were using the checklist and raising concerns with the student if subsequently funding was not found to be possible if the student didn't qualify for DSA. So 
how would you respond to that, Sarah, that if they're, it's a, an HE institution, would you want to see a lecturer using the checklist with a student or would you want to see a lecturer with a concern kind of going through a different route initially? Um, I, I guess it depends um, on how the um, each individual university, like I said, you know, has a different setup, um, and I think it's very dependent upon what that setup is. Um, so it's quite difficult for me to actually say what would be best. Um, you know, I think that lecturers, you know, have just as much um, involvement, in, if not more, that they are teaching those students, um, and you know, they they need to know their students. And um, I think that if they have that awareness of, of what particular challenges that student has by going through the checklist with them, um, that would be amazing, that would be fab. But I also understand that, that they are busy, they have stuff to do, um, in which case maybe they should then refer them on to somebody within the support department. But whatever, you know, I do think um, knowing your student is vital because you know, then you can teach them the best way that they learn. Okay, Sarah, so this is sort of in a similar vein, but a slightly different one. And I think, I suspect you're going to want to refer to next week's webinar, but, you know, I'm just guessing. So this is from Oran, and he says, funding isn't usually the, it's the resourcing issue. It's mainly about having the staff time to deliver additional training, especially with the current culture of zero hours contracts. So how would you tackle that if you've not got time to train your staff? Yeah, I fully empathise with that one as well. And I know things are getting tighter and tighter by the day, it seems. Um, and, and really, you know, if, if it can be incorporated within any staff meetings or, you know, if you could set up some sort of lunchtime webinar thing like we're doing here now, um, you know, it, it, it really is, I think it's so important because, you know, if these students are helped and supported by everyone within the college, the success rates are going to, you know, go sky high, which is what you want at the end of the day. So, um, I know it's difficult, I really, really understand that, um, but I think there are ways and means, where, you know, like I say, if it is just, you know, a quick half an hour or 20 minute session in the staff room um, where you can distribute some bits of the information, you know, it's going to be different for every single one of you, um, you know, how you go about that. Um, and I do wish you the best of luck with it, but, you know, I do feel it's such an important thing that we need to spread right throughout all the tutors, teachers, lecturers, everyone, you know, in spite of the, the time issues involved, which I fully empathise with. Hi, hi, Sarah. I have, I think, one last question for you here, which is from Rachel, who says, can you give any advice about when you are working with large groups and where you have more than one student with different needs, as it can be really difficult to meet all the needs at once. Yes, Rachel, again, I fully empathise with that one. Um, differentiating for you know, a high number of students in the class with all their different needs is, is a very, very difficult uh, thing for you to be able to do. Um, and I think that, like I said before about this being inclusive, you know, making certain uh, strategies, tools, resources within the classroom available to everyone. Um, you know, having some coloured paper on the table that people can use if they need to. Um, you know, allowing that little bit of extra time for uh, tasks to be completed. Um, you know, spending that little bit of extra time at the end of the session just to go through step by step with everyone, you know, what they're duties are for that week for their homework, what they need to do, just in simple bullet points, ensuring that they know what they have to do before they come back to that class next week or the next day. Um, so it's just, you know, being as inclusive as you can and differentiating as best you can, which you know, I know is a huge, huge ask, um, but 
you know, again, I wish you the best of luck with that. But I think that um, in next week's session, you will be given a whole range of ideas that you can try out, and I'm sure you've got some of your own as well. Um, you know, maybe you will have a better idea after session three. Um, and also, I'll go on to the next screen here just to um, show you that uh, we have a, 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 a um, contact details that if you do have any specific questions that um, that haven't been answered either this week or, or next week, um, we would be happy to um, to answer any further questions for you. Thank you very much, Sarah. I think that's all our questions for now. So thank you very, very much. There are a few that we're just in the process of replying to on the webinar as well. So we are really sorry if you if you didn't quite get your question in. We've tried to do as many as we can and where we've commented or added information We've sort of taken one where there were maybe two or three, but thank you for everybody who's asked those questions. If you would like to, you can send your questions to Sarah up until the end of January, or you can, or actually you can get, you can um, send your questions to Sarah until the end of March, or myself until the end of March, which is the end of the project. And to be honest, if we heard from you after that, we would not be upset. And um, on Sarah's screen, you've got both of our email addresses, I think. Yes. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Sarah. So part three of the training will be delivered by us next week, and we are delivering the post-16 training on the 2nd of February. So if you haven't already signed up, please do. Thank you very much for t attending tonight's session. It's been really lovely to have so many people here with us. And um, if I think there were some points in the webinar where we lost Sarah ever so slightly because of the connection. What Sarah, I'm hoping, was doing was recording the webinar, so we will be publishing the webinar on our website as well, so you sh if you wanted to listen again, you'll be able to do so. Um, it is definitely t if I would definitely advise um, taking some time to look through the materials in your own time and start to digest them and think about how you can put them in place in, in your institution. But I would like to say thank you very much to Sarah for presenting for us this evening. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for your time, Sarah. Thank you to everyone who's attended. It's really lovely to see you all involved. And we look forward to seeing you again next week.